I may do this. I'm working on a poem for you. A love poem? Yeah, I guess if it's for you, it's a love poem. You're good at hiding stuff, huh? What am I gonna do? <laughs> we are currently discussing exploration. No one understands what my life has become. You've done nothing to be ashamed of. I want you. Why are you looking at me? We could be something, the two of us. You see black men paraded across the screen in handcuffs. Super predatory. You better believe it. Congratulations on 54 years, or going into your 54th year. Are you I'm excited? turning 56, so 50, yeah. Oh, excuse me. No, yeah. that's me. Yeah. 54 years of the festival. It's not about you right, not right now, yeah, not yet. 54 years at the festival. Um, congratulations. It's an incredible slate of films, as we saw in, in that trailer. It's an incredible slate every year. You guys are kind of the last of the large film festivals that are showing everybody the sort of great films that are coming out this year on the world stage and on the national stage. Can we... Talk about how you go about selecting these films, how each of you are a part of that, because each of you have different titles, but I know all four of you are kind of involved in the, the selection of the films. Can you see how tired they are? Yeah. <laughs> these two right here. You this that bad. <laughs> okay. He's been watching movies nonstop. I mean. Well, I mean, it's a year-long process. You know, we do it the whole, we do it all year, really. There's a selection committee that's myself, Dennis, Amy Taubin, and Florence Almazzini, and we're always looking for films. People are coming to us with films. We're going to the Cannes Film Festival. We're going to other film festivals. And then, of course, you know, during the summer, we're looking at films that um, haven't opened yet. Um, we have a mandate for world premieres in our gala slots. Sometimes in all three, as is the case with this year, every once in a while, you know, one of them is just a is a North American premiere. Um, but um, you know, it's a year-round search. Let's say that between the end of the festival and for like five minutes after, there's a little lull. <laughs> so, are you in the midst of a little lull right now, as you've selected the films and you're going into the festival? Yeah, this is very much not a lull. I not at all. <laughs> No, I think it's just kind of the craziest time for us. I mean, we have a very busy period in the summer where we're locking the program, which is towards the end of July. Um, and now we're just, you know, I think just the, all the logistics of getting people here um, and planning the screenings. I mean, we have, we year-round, we, we um, operate three screens, but during the festival, we have five screens. So it's a pretty uh, complicated um, process. Um, six screens this year. Six? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, uh, Eugene, how Bruno has the festival Walter. changed oh. uh, over the years? How is the festival this, e this year different than it was last year or the year before? It, it, the festival really changed. I mean, I started going to the festival more than 20 years ago, and it was a much smaller, um, uh, really an event that was really focused on just a couple of venues. And as Kent and Dennis mentioned, it's expanded. Um, not only is the Film Society, Dennis is our director of programming year-round, so not only is the Film Society doing and presenting movies year-round, um, the festival itself for these 17 days, 17-day festival, which is significant, um, the festival is presenting venues and events in more, or films and, event, films and events in more venues than ever before. Um, multiple screens on West 65th Street, we do free events as well. So I think if you look at it over kind of just the last five years since our film center opened at 65th Street, uh, you see just a um, bigger audience, more screens, more movies, more events, uh, more talks. It just feels like the footprint of the festival um, at Lincoln Center is just larger, I think. Yeah. Would you agree with that, Leslie? Yeah, uh, well, we opened the Eleanor Bunin Monroe Film Center five years ago, and that's made a huge impact not only at the New York Film Festival, but year round. Um, I'll just say I'm not involved in the programming of the festival. I'm the executive director. There's a very particular process for programming, and Kent uh, is the director of the festival and in, responsible for basically running all of the programming that we see. Um, 
I, this year we're expanding also to the Bruno Walter Auditorium, which is at the New York Library for the Performing Arts. We're always in Alice Tully Hall and in our own Walter Reed Theater, which has been open for 25 years. We're celebrating its 25th anniversary. So it's only 25 years that we've had our own theater to program, um, and as Dennis says, we program all year. We're open every day of the year. We want you all to come out. We, we have a lot of events all year, free talks. Uh, we have student screenings. We have festivals and series retrospectives. Um, we really, One of the best retrospectives in in, in the city, I, I think, at the Film Society of Lincoln Center. Absolutely. Oh, and that's thanks to Dennis and his team who work year round on on that programming. So we really provide a great diversity in terms of what we offer to audiences, and um, we are located right in the middle of Lincoln Center. But we hope that people from around the city are coming to see what we're doing all year round. One of the things that I've always liked about the New York Film Festival in comparison to the other festivals that are happening just around this time is that it feels like it's inadvertently uh, in, in, injected into the conversations around the Oscars just by programming the best movies around the world, whereas some of the other festivals are trying to sort of be some sort of precursor to the Oscars. The New York Film Festival is actually just programming the best movies that may end up at the Oscars. But that said, how much do you guys try to interject or inject the festival into sort of cultural conversations that are going on at the moment, specifically the election that we're having right now? Those are two different cultural conversations. <laughs> <laughs> the Oscars. Um, although the Oscars is every year for you. The election is just right now. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah. It's, but it feels like a lifetime. Um, I think that, you know, the, 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 the thing about the Oscars, and when you say award season, it's not just the Oscars. It's the Golden Globes and the Oscars and it's the um, months and months of preparation and um, dialogues and breakfasts and lunches and dinners that the directors and the actors have to go to as they, you know, try to, you know, campaign. Um, it's become this, you know, kind of cottage industry. And so um, do we think about that? No. I'm, 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 you know, being perfectly honest when I say it's coincidental to what we do because what we do is very simple. We don't program by theme. We don't program according to, you know, how many premieres we can get or how many stars we can get on the carpet. We don't have a market, we don't have awards, and we don't have juries. What we do is have a festival based on programming. That's the mission, you know, to say, these are films that we've selected, and not just that we've selected because we think you might like them or we think that somebody might like them or they might represent this or that. We've selected them because we love them and we want to share them with you. If you don't like them, that's okay. We, you know, we're up with, for having a conversation about it, but that's the point of programming and having that festival. And really, it's something that you know, um, our uh, board has always supported and, in fact, reminded us of it. You know, so I think that every once in a while, it's true, we do get you know, spoken of in relation to award season. The Gone Girl premiere is spoken yeah. of as the, yeah. It was the Gone Girl premiere. There was, you know, the fact that Birdman was the closing night of the New York Film Festival and it won the Oscar. There was, you know, um, last year there were, you know, there was Bridge of Spies, for instance. You know, that was a world premiere and it wasn't one of the gala slots. But that's because, you know, it, it, filmmakers want to come to us because they respect the mission and that's a great thing. Um, as far as the election goes... <laughs> what do you got? Well... I mean, you know, we're opening for the first time in the history of the festival with a documentary. I suppose that, you know, we chose it because it's a great movie, but I mean, you know, also, let's say maybe that's not coincidental. You know, these things turn up afterwards when people talk about the themes and the selection. You know, my answer is always very simple. It's like, well, you, you tell me. You know, You're referring to Ava DuVernay's documentary, Ava right? Ava DuVernay's documentary, 13th, which is about um, the mass... Well, it's a, yes, the title is in relation to the 13th Amendment, which is the amendment to the Constitution that abolished slavery, but it's specifically in relation to the clause in the 13th Amendment stipulating that slavery is abolished except in cases of punishment for crimes committed, right? Thus, you have the prison industry and mass incarceration, which is one of the great tragedies in, in the country. And so it's, a, it's, um, it's one of those issues that it lurks behind a lot but that isn't crystallized a lot in, in big conversations the way that, say, immigration is, you know. But it's, it's just as great a tragedy, and it's our tragedy. And so it was, you know, making a movie about it. Um, so this is the first time ever you guys have opened the, the festival with a documentary? Yep. Was that a major decision? What goes behind a decision like that? 
Well, I, you know, the, what goes behind the decision about, you know, is sitting, discussing and saying, hey, do we want to do this? And yes. I mean, that's it. That's it? Yep, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No uh, closed door meetings. No uh, getting. Oh, well, you know. I mean, look, it's it's it's. Um... But does that show for you as people who have been programming for, programming for a while, been a part of film culture for a while, showcase a sort of uh, deleting of the lines between what is cinema and what isn't? Documentary, even going back to Michael Moore's first movie, was a sort of dif viewed differently than I think it it really is now. Same with same with TV and movies. Everything is kind of coming together in a in a different way. That's right. And Michael Moore's first movie is a perfect example of the line, you know, the, the barrier breaking between fiction and documentary. I think what's really interesting about it, if you, when you see the film, um, what Ava is doing is um, she's exploring this really vital, crucial issue that's connected to so much of what's going on in this country right now. Um, and she's doing it by exploring um, the real stories of people right now and also how, um, how our own history even the history of cinema itself, has influenced the way that um, people of color are looked at in this country today. And I think that, um, I mean, there's no more perfect moment to be looking at that than a month out of an election, presidential in, in, election. In a couple nights after the first debate. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that it's just, you know... It's one of the candidates said well, blacks when, and Latinos are living in hell. Yeah, and also when one of the candidates talked about how great it was that he had this, you know... Club in Palm Springs that welcomed people of all races and genders. I mean, just like, whoa, is it 1965? You know? Also spoke positively about stop and frisk. We could just mm -hmm. go on and on. Yeah, we could go on and on. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, so, what, what are some other films that you guys are excited about this year? There's an, an incredible slate. I know you maybe don't want to single anything out, but. <laughs> Um, it's tough to, yeah, it's tough to single out films. I mean, you know, I should point out that beyond the main slate, I think you saw only main slate films, mo mostly main slate films in the in the trailer. But we, it is um, a festival that's expanded. We have a, a documentary section. We have a section for experimental work. Um, we have uh, a new section this year. Actually, you asked what was different about the festival. We actually created a new section for the first time in in, in some years called explorations um, and it's a it's a small showcase for what we think are some of the more adventurous voices in, in contemporary cinema today um, we have um, a, an interactive multimedia section called convergence um, you know so it's, it's actually a very large festival um, but to come back to your question about singling out films I, I, I feel like I want to single out Paul Verhoeven's new film L uh, partly because we're also doing a, a Paul Verhoeven complete retrospective in, in November uh, at the Film Society. Um, I think this, this is, is uh, Verhoeven's first film in 10 years, you know, first film in French. Um, and um, I mean, he's had an interesting career. I think he's somebody who's, you know, a, a lot of his films were pretty controversial on their initial release. But, um, you know, someone that film culture has sort of caught up with, a lot of his films, I think, have been rehabilitated with time. Um, and this film was, was um, I think, quite a success at the Cannes Film Festival. It features an amazing performance by Isabel Huppert as a, a woman who su uh, suffers a, a brutal rape um, uh, in the first scene of the film and, and responds to that in, in, in very surprising uh, and uh, in ultimately, I think, very, in very empowering ways. So. Am I wrong to call this? I haven't seen it yet. Am I wrong to call it Paul Verhoeven's Miss 45? Is that? Does that characterize it appropriately? Um, it's not, I don't think it's, no. well, I mean, it's certainly, I think, you know, it's in conversation with this uh, genre of rape revenge films, but I think it's definitely, it puts a very interesting spin on it. Absolutely. And you talk about this sort of new section of the, of the festival that's more exploratory filmmaking. This is why film festivals, I think, are so important. I, I wonder if you would agree with me, is that they are a showcase where films are not just sort of about the sort of consumerist angle on them, where even so many Oscar-driven movies are about how you can drive the biggest audience. This is about seeing film as an, as an art form. And film festivals are really where you can do that. Well, this is the essence of what we do at the Film Society. And we're devoted to the art and the craft of film. And uh, it's important to us that the films that we show at the festival and that we are screening all year long um, are really exemplary of the kind of the art form of film. 
Um, there are a lot of films in our country that never get distribution. There'll be some films that we show at our own festival that will never be seen beyond the, our festival because of the very limited uh, distribution um, mechanisms here in our country. Um, we are an art house cinema, and that's a certain kind of cinema that is attempting to show films. Uh, not, you know, there are many art house cinemas here in New York and around the country, and they're looking at film in a different way. It's not that they're not, and we're not calculating how successful a film might be because we are trying to bring people into our theaters, but that's not why we choose a film. We don't choose it on that basis. Um, and I think there, it, it's unfortunate in our country that a lot of our cinema is, is very limited in terms of what it offers the general public. And that is why festivals still thrive. That's why ours does. Uh, and I think why so many festivals around the country and around the world still thrive. Because filmmakers, artists are out there making this work. Uh, we want to be a home to that work, and we are. Um, and we wish more were distributed more widely, but we do provide a home for them. I mean, it's interesting because this festival, and, and I mentioned you know, starting to go to it 20 years ago, and it's, it's, it's something that's so exciting to just sample. Because at a festival like the New York Film Festival, you not only have one of the greatest actors of French cinema, Jean-Pierre Léo, who's coming, and he's working with one of the more exciting um, younger filmmakers who's out there right now um, in a film called Death of Louis XIV. Um, but at the same time, you have Kristen Stewart in three movies. We have documentaries about Stephen Sondheim and a musical that he created decades ago, as well as a documentary about Hamilton. So there's this kind of cross-section of, of so much of what's interesting about culture, both contemporary and also looking back, um, that, that the festival you know, connects and brings such, such an interesting array, an interesting mix of talent all at one time to this one place. You mentioned a documentary about Hamilton. When you go into programming the festival, how important is it for the films and the work within it to reflect what's going on in the city or elements of the city itself that the festival takes place in? Um, I was just going to say, I don't think we, we start out trying to make any kind of, of statement um, with programming, but I think every program inevitably is a statement. You know, I think it's just whether, whether or not you intend it to be. Um, and I, you know, people have commented and asked um, Kent and me about just the number of films with um, sort of political and social relevance in this year's festival. And I think that a lot of that has to do with filmmakers responding to um, to current events and to history in a you know particular urgent way today, and um, we don't make or commission these films. You know, these are filmmakers who are responding to the culture, and we it's our job, I think, in turn to respond to these films and filmmakers. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, every any given year, every film is going to be a response to the same set of circumstances, the same moment. It's just it's you know, in some cases, it's going to be more overt, sometimes more subterranean. Sometimes you have to look a little bit through the, you know, uh, you know, kind of open the curtains to see where the response is. But the response is always there. So that's where things become exciting because that means that all the films are kind of talking to each other in a way. And of course that's inevitable in the way in how we're selecting the films. We're just not thinking of it as we're doing it. Just, sorry, did you? Well, I'm just gonna make sure everyone knows that there are actually still tickets available to 13th on Friday night. So, uh, you know, please go to the website and check it out. Um, it's also important to www.filmlink.org. Well, well, thank you, Ken. Sorry. <laughs> I guess I thought something was maybe a graphic was around me that might say Anything that, but I don't know. Um, but thank you. But yes, it's please the first check documentary. It out. It's it's the first documentary they've op ever opened the festival with. It's Ava DuVernay. It's about the. It's an important documentary. And if tickets are still available for Friday night, you gotta go. You gotta go get tickets. We're, we're releasing a, an additional batch of tickets today for not only um, tomorrow night opening night, but for a number of. Uh, high demand films throughout the festival and today we're also announcing additional screenings of some of the films that have been the most popular that'll play on the final day of the festival as well. Oh, wow. And please also check out the free talks that we do. Uh, Eugene is responsible for programming those and um, they're very popular. We have a really great attendance. We also have director's dialogues which are free talks. Um, but we really do have a lot of availability still of certain tickets. There certainly are sold out or standby uh, screenings because they're in high demand. But it's important to check back 
to the website, even if you've seen a film that looks like it's sold out, we release tickets on a rolling basis and try to make them available. Also for standby lines, there's always a standby line and we very often get folks in to the theater even when there's a standby line. Absolutely, I have another question about programming. Um, there, I think last year, the year before, there were some rules that Toronto, the Toronto Film Festival and Telluride had made up where if you premiered one place, you couldn't premiere at another place. But you guys program films that have been being shown all year long at certain festivals, you know, particularly I think of like Manchester by the Sea, which was at Sundance, at Telluride, at Toronto. What makes you still want to program something that's been at these other festivals? Is it the film is so good, like we're just gonna show it? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought that was the What answer. you said. Yeah. No, you know, I mean, th th here's the thing. I mean, th yes, I remember this kind of like little blow up that went on between Telluride and Toronto. And by the way, Telluride for the most part shows films that are not world premieres too. I mean, but we're talking about then it gets to be the North American premiere. Um, you know, again, it's something that we don't, uh, we come, because of where we come in the calendar, but also because of what the mission is and because of what the festival is, it's something that doesn't really you know, affect us, um, not in any, you know, meaningful way. And as a matter of fact, I have to say that as time has gone on, you know, when I first started at the New York Film Festival Selection Committee back in the early 2000s, the idea of anything from one of the Hollywood studios, the term is kind of a euphemism now, but, you know, um, being e offered to us, you know, was just unthinkable. I mean, even smaller movies. I remember we invited a film once and they said, sorry, we just don't want to be tainted with the festival brush. Um, that changed, you know, and the reason it changed is because all the specialty divisions closed down and it's getting harder and harder for people to make movies like Paul Thomas Anderson, for instance, you know, Who Wes premiered, Anderson. premiered Inherent Vice with you guys, Yes, right? he did, yeah, yeah he yeah. did. Um, and thank God he's working on a new movie now with Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, but I mean, it's hard for people to get these movies made and it's easier and easier to get less ambitious movies made. So, you know, and as Leslie said, uh, distribution is getting tougher. It's easy for people to get films seen on smaller screens, but then how do you know where to look and what you're looking for and how do you find your way to smaller works? And so all of that um, with the big films and the small kind of works, you know, it's, 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 it's been um, a welcome development for us. I think it sort of makes the mission of the festival even purer that you're kind of like, no, these are, the films that we loved, it doesn't matter where they premiered, we're gonna show them here because these are the films, these are the best films according to us that, that, that we've seen this year. Yeah, but then by the same token, when we have the world premiere mandate, we're saying, okay, so we have to make choices within those parameters. But even then, we're not just saying, oh, well, we'll take that because we can get a world premiere out of it. And your world premiere mandate is met with very, very great films this, this year. I mean, we're also investing in an experience. And I think that, you know, if you're watching this talk right now, you're likely watching it. Um, on a laptop, on a computer, on a device of some sort, a smaller screen. Um, we're investing in an experience of cinema on a big screen with an audience, with the talent who made the film there to engage with you. Um, we're preserving and celebrating the experience of the movies, that something that is, you know, again, you talk about 54 years old, this is, this is part of the mission and history of the organization itself, is to preserve that experience, to celebrate that experience. Um, it's, it's unlike anything you can have watching the movie on a screen that's that big. I want to meet the person who's watching this talk in their home theater scenario for, for some reason. Like, why they're doing Why are you doing I want the visual pleasure of these yeah. five people talking. Paying, right paying attention to the beauty of the image of, of us. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's open it up to the audience for, uh, for some questions. Hey guys, I absolutely cannot wait to see the Merrily We Roll Along documentary, and I want to know if you could share a little bit more about that. Leslie has an interesting yeah, I think one of the, story on this. Yeah, Leslie might have something to offer about that. Well, is this a planted question? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's very funny because um, I'm a documentary filmmaker by trade, and the last project that I worked on before I took this job at the Film Society was this documentary about Merrily, and I gave it up with a lot of you know, heartache, to be honest, and I'm delighted that it's been made, but I was at the beginning of that project, and it's basically a film that's been made by the director, Lonnie Price, 
who is the original star of Merrily We Roll Along, which is a famous flop of Stephen Sondheim's and Hal Prince of the early 80s. And this film is ostensibly a look at the um, experience of those actors and performers who uh, were in that original show and they had bonded. It was a really transformative experience for them. And they were all teenagers. Um, yes, they were all teenagers during, during the making of that uh, the theatrical piece, and now Lonnie is basically looking back with them on that experience and where they've come in their life, which mirrors the, the, the story in Merrily, as you may know. The fact that it was all documented is interesting. Yes, and there, well, the other part of the story is that there was footage that was shot that had been thought to be lost of that original production on the making of it, and it was discovered and used in this film. Um, it's very funny, because there are people that kind of come out of the closet about Merrily Roll Long. It's like it doesn't matter who, where you are. If you say something merrily, they're like, "There's those. There's a certain person that loves that show, yeah. and I guess that's you in this <laughs> crowd." Who, per, you know, I didn't even. I know his work, and I love his work, but that was not a show that I had a lot of attachment to. But when I worked on it, I remember very well that experience of a person who had a very fierce attachment to it. Mm -hmm. The cast album is considered like one of the best cast albums or something, but. And it's performed by many high schools. So, but please come to it. It's going to be a great experience. Stephen Sondheim will be there. Um, and I think people will really uh, get a lot out of that film. I was also going to mention Bright Lights, which is a film about another kind of look at Hollywood, really, the film about Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher, um, which is a really terrific film and, and looks at Hollywood, it looks at families, it looks at mental illness. It's really quite um, expansive, I think, in the themes that it explores. Um, and it's sort of that behind the scenes theme that's very similar in both films. Um, but that's pretty much the only connection I would make about that. For <laughs> Anything but. about Carrie Fisher is wildly compelling, I have to say. And she will be there, too. You, sh you should invite her onto this stage. because she's Oh, my God, please, amazing. with her dog? And that'd be incredible. The dog will be here. If, if she is, yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Hey, uh, so I'll be volunteering again for uh, this film festival. And, uh, but you're wearing a Tribeca shirt. I know. I didn't Sit get down. My, uh, Sit down. We did notice that. We did not, notice that. I didn't get my uh, shirt What's yet. going on I'll there? I'm going to pick it up today. Okay. Uh, um, right. You promise? I do. Okay. Yeah. Right after this. Um, so I was wondering, like, how much technology has uh, affected the festival? Like, I know, uh, you know, some festivals like Trebek are doing more VR. Um, has uh, New York Film Festival, like, started maybe going towards that route? We certainly have. We have a convergence section. And it's been programmed by our colleague Matt Bullish for how many years? Is it five years? Five years. Fifth year. Fifth year. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's spectacular. And uh, I urge you to come. The, the dates for convergence are. Convergence starts this Saturday. Yeah. Yep. Check it out. Yeah. A lot of that is free too. You just have to come in. You know, experience all these experiences. Yeah. That's what I with keep your, saying. With your with your trip. Experience back the experience. <laughs> <laughs> What about uh, what about the preservation of, of, of film at the festival? Because I'd imagine a lot of the screenings are DCP now as well from, from some people. But then there's also the retrospectives that you talk about, and I'd imagine there are some 35 millimeter films coming in as well. Yeah, in the retrospective, I mean, you know, I must say that one of the most beautiful films that we're showing is this incredible documentary by Bertrand Tavernier about the history of French cinema, right? And so the um, retrospective piece of the festival, and this is a, a, like a three and a half hour in, intensely personal survey, and he's really, I must say, the only person who could really do this at this point in history because he knows that, that history inside and out. So we're doing um, a little selection of films that are crucial to his movie, and then a selection of movies by Henry Hathaway, who's a great American filmmaker from who started in the early 30s and made movies up through the 70s, um, and who was a contemporary of John Ford and Howard Hawks, and uh, was really one of the great studio directors, um, an amazing technician, and um, a movie by the way, a guy by the way who made some great New York location movies. There's a movie we're showing called 14 Hours, that was shot on location downtown. It's based on the case of a of a jumper in the 30s who, you know, stood at the top of a building and he was, you know, had a cop trying to talk him off the ledge for like, you know, eight hours or something like that. So they made this amazing movie out of it and shot it right there, you know, down in Lower Manhattan. And so you can see 60 years ago, you know, get a, get a glimpse of what Lower Manhattan was like or his movie Kiss of Death, 
with Richard Woodmark, you know, which is also, you know, very much a, loca a New York location movie. But the reason that that's there is because Bertrand is the one who really, I must say, wrote more eloquently about Henry Hathaway than anybody, and so it's kind of a twofold tribute to him. Is there, but do you guys have a mandate to sort of program 35 and 35 millimeter? And stuff? Well, a mandate. I mean, we try to do as much of it as we can. If a, if a good 35 millimeter print exists, it is our preference to show yeah. it. I mean, it's our preference to show a film, a film in, in, you know, in the format that it was originally intended. It's not always possible. And increasingly, even in restorations, a lot of them are done digitally these days and so are available as DCPs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, I think we, we try to show prints when we can. Will RoboCop or Total Recall be shown as 35? A good number of the Paul Verhoeven films will be on 35 millimeter, yes. I mean, the, the truth is that I just want to say that, you know, the situation that we're in now in terms of making prints is, you know, tough. And, and yeah. Kodak is really, really, you know, doing a full court press to try to bring, to keep 35 millimeter alive along with filmmakers like uh, Christopher Nolan and Paul Thomas Anderson. But, you know, it's hard to get good prints made, too, new prints. We might have a single 35 millimeter print in the main slate, but I'm not sure. It might Next be question. Hi, uh, my name is Alicia Portier, and I want to first say it's an honor to see the behind the scenes creatives of such an event or festival. And I have two questions. One, for someone who's coming for the first time, what do you want them to get out of it? And like which day, if they only had like one day or two to go, would be the most experience they will have? And is the volunteering process closed already? Volunteer process is it? I don't. Closed I don't know if volunteer process is closed. You, if you go to our website, uh, there'll be a, a, a section there for volunteers, and I think we we use a lot of volunteers during the festival, and I'm sure there's a still opportunity. So definitely check that out. It's a 17 day festival, so by day 10, we're going to need to like refresh ourselves a little bit. We're going to need all the help we can get. So definitely. <laughs> but as far as your first question, we want you to have. Um, I mean, you know. We're, we're saying all these things about the availability of tickets and about the, the, um, the, the range of the programming and because we want as many people as possible to come and have an experience and share it. We want to share what we've chosen with everybody. If we just chose it and said, okay, well, we're going to you know, go to the usual suspects and you know, just kind of lock it down, then it would be meaningless. It's only meaningful if we have you know, a community of people coming and responding to it. If they don't like every film, that's great. It doesn't matter. The point is you know, the conversation. And so I can't, it's hard for any of us to single out any single moment in the festival. You should pick a moment and you know, don't do it with your you know, blindfolded or anything. I mean, you know. I don't know. I think doing that with a blindfold is pretty good. Um, yeah, because really? yeah, I, I would actually encourage anybody who's coming to the festival especially first timers to, to, to actually take a chance on something you've never mm -hmm. heard of. Yeah. yeah, I think that's because there's so much on yeah. offer and that's like really is the best way to discover um, a film festival is to just, you know, just dive in. I take it back. Well, Bring the blindfold. <laughs> and I just want to mention also that we have student memberships and um, if you become a student member, there are a lot of events that we do throughout the year that are geared towards students. We invite you to specific events that are, that are really behind the scenes a little bit where we try to create more private facing events. Um, but there really are a lot of events throughout the day and a weekend, but also every, every day of the week we have a free talk that starts at seven o'clock in our amphitheater. So you can always wander over if you're around, at least you can dip into that and see what's going on. But convergence projections, we didn't really yeah. talk we, about. We also have discounted rush tickets for a lot of screenings, so. Yes. Yeah. I would suggest downloading the app open it up and find the movie that is the most jarring, intimidating, scary, or, or peculiar to you, and go see it. Last question. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody else is thinking this, but your jobs are awesome. <laughs> so I was wondering, like, what major did you take up in college? Because I want to be like you guys. <laughs> Uh, I didn't study film, um, so uh, no, I, I, it's, I don't think it's about what you major in. I studied mathematics, so it really has nothing to do with... Uh, um, there are many ways to get into, um, you know, to film, film industry, uh, film programming. Uh, I think there's 
a lot of volunteer and internship opportunities. Um, I think the most important thing uh, is really to be a part of film culture, which is a very easy thing. It's just really to go to movies, um, whether it's at festivals or you know at art houses um, or at, you know rep repertory houses, and and discover and connecting with a community of people. Um, that's that's I think that's how all of us got into it, really. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think that what I majored in or you know studied in college to me seems not applicable to what it is that I bring to movies and the movies have given to me. You know, I, my own relationship with them goes back to when I was very, very young, you know, before I was 10. And so it's just something that is a personal relationship and it's nothing that I don't think, I, I doubt that I could have no, I don't doubt. I know that I couldn't have found it anywhere else than that. So, you know, it's what you're driven to. That's that's the most important thing. Can I tell my mom that? Sure. Because <laughs> she's like, you got to go to college, and you got to yeah. go to college and do what you want can to you, college for. Can you text me your number? So I, could... <laughs> okay. I mean, the thing, the thing about that is that, I mean, I majored in American studies with an emphasis on history and film. But my major, my real major in college, um, was everything I did outside of the classroom. I got in, I volunteered very early on in the student-run film society, um, picking and choosing and showing and promoting films on campus, and then I started pr producing concerts and, and speakers, lecture series. Um, but it was everything I did outside of the classroom. Well, the classroom was, was the core, the foundation, everything I read and learned and talked about, but it was everything I was doing outside of that time in the classroom that became my real major, and that, that's what led me to what I do here, what I do today. I was a film major, sorry. Um, Me too. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Purchase College, right up, Purchase. right up the road, practically. Um, but I don't think that's usual necessarily, you know. And I think that I, I always say to folks that it's important to just get a well-rounded education. That. The thing that I enjoyed about my education there was for me, I wanted something that was very rigorous and was oriented to production and had a very specific outcome because for me, that's what I wanted. Um, and I just don't think that's for everyone. I just don't think that's true. But I, I will say that I was exposed to a lot of film culture growing up here in New York. Uh, my father used to take me to Theater 80 St. Mark's, which is right down the street here, and we saw a lot of great double features of movies that are not, you know, Abbott and Costello meet... Rear projection. Rear proje <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a rear projection screen of 16 millimeter, actually. Um, I saw a lot of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies down there, and there was a whole kind of culture in New York in the 60s and 70s, which is how old I am and how when I lived here, <laughs> that you would go to see a double feature of a movie that would be a, a kind of quote-unquote B-movie or even, you know, just a classic movie, but that was the only place you could see it because you couldn't go on your TV and pick... Hulu and choose a Criterion collection and watch the stuff, you know, have it available to you. And I think that technologically, that's an enormous change that has happened. My kids don't receive film the same way that I did. I went to a theater, walked into it, sat down and watched it, and their perception of film is a thing that they can call up at any time. And the experience of going to a theater is something that they do when they want to watch a big movie but a lot of other movies are screened you know, at home. Um, I will say that I was exposed to Film Comment, which is a publication of the Film Society, um, which I'm very proud of, and that is also over 50 years old. And uh, my aunt and uncle gave me a subscription to Film Comment when I was in college, and it was very meaningful to me uh, to have that magazine and be exposed to film culture in that way. And I still have all of my copies from that time. I kept them. Um, and for me, it was an, a great entree into that world of film culture. Absolutely. And it still is. It's possibly the best uh, film magazine that there that there is out there. Quote. <laughs> I, don't, I can come up with a better quote than that. Something a little more articulate. Somebody for you. better tweet that. I hope someone's <laughs> tweeting that right now. I, I would. I would. I would say if you were interested in pursuing the path that they are, it's going off the beaten path of film culture and reading and writing about it and exposing yourself to as many different kinds of movies and 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 artists out there. It's the only way to really, if you truly love film, that's you'll just find yourself doing that and you'll end up sort of finding yourself in a position like them or 
me interviewing people about it. <laughs> um, guys, congrats on the 54th year. Thank you so much for being here. The festival starts tomorrow. Get tickets. Get tickets at... What? Filmlink.org. Filmlink.org, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.